coming up, and then we had to basically start yeah, facility questions between who has questions in the room with the mask, and then turning off, signing off one uh, time pass. So, okay. Nothing like super technical. And you found the spirit like, just say like, it, no answer. Yeah. Saying, you're ready, you're all good to go. I found it. I found it. I found it. I found it. I was 20 years old and I never, um, okay, cool. I never really kicked in with a hole in my hand. It's been empty and we found a historical safe. That's what I was going to ask you if it wasn't a historical site. Yeah. I found a, a cool, it looked like a, Hi, Roland, can you hear me? Look like an axe head, eh? Can you hear that? Hello. Hello. Uh, I was up town the one I could always say, you know what? I think the most of legend. Legend goes terrible. Hello. The room is ah, we can hear you loud and clear now. Good. Me too. I mean, I can hear you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let me make you a co-host real quick. My name is Johnny. Good to meet you, Johnny, and I'm Rowan. Um, and that should allow you to share your screen. I'll need that, I'll need that wrong. Well, yeah, I was taking care of it for you. I didn't realize that, but... <laughs> I'll see you later. Yeah, I, thought, I thought about that. Looks great. We can see the screen and you. Oh, my gosh. Don't do that okay. again. And you can hear you loud and clear as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can hear you, I, you can hear me, good. Great. Maybe I'll just make count give it a minute or two to see if anything else trickles in, then we'll close the door for you. Our cousins? Sure. You know, because back then we didn't have just one kid, but we had to pull the rocks and shoot the wood pile. Is this the first one you've seen? Oh, this is the first one. Frank had the morning loop. Frank had all the morning, yeah. Frank and Matthew, I think. We got them up. That's good. Cool. Yeah. Hey, we're getting started. Hi. How are you? Enjoying very much? Yeah, it's beautiful. The only time I was ever here was in high school for cross country. Um, I just remember it was gray and wet. <laughs> like everything. <laughs> All right. Roland, it is 1.15, and the floor is yours. All right. Is there a way for me to see the audience? Great. Yeah. Okay, right on. Um, how much time do I have? Oh, wow, the whole time. Great. Yeah, let me know maybe, uh, well, we wanted to keep questions until the end. That's the general instruction, correct? Okay. Um so maybe five minutes to two, let me know, and then I start shutting up. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So I can start now? All right, I will do that. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. I am Dr. Roland Bohr. Um, I'm here at the University of Winnipeg in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And that is also the homeland of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Metis nations. That's where I'm speaking from, Treaty 1 territory in Manitoba. Uh, I'm a historian. I teach North American indigenous history here at the history department. And one of my research areas or interest, interest areas is indigenous or Native American technology, especially hunting weapons, and how indigenous people use their traditional weaponry compared to 
weapons introduced from Europe, mostly firearms. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about how I got into all of this. Um, it started really when I began to study North American indigenous history, and I found very um, contrasting assessments of the capabilities of indigenous weaponry, as well as early uh, European firearms. So I began to read primary documents, the journals of explorers and fur traders, for example, who were um, in different parts of North America at the time. And then eventually I also had the opportunity to interact with and learn from indigenous elders in different parts of the United States and Canada. And finally also, <clears throat> sorry, um, I had the opportunity to examine surviving original bows, arrows and shields and other items in museum collections. So taken together with all of that information, I started to manufacture my own bows and arrows to see uh, along the lines of, of surviving originals to see how they would perform, how they would stack up. And that's what got me into bow making, into archery. And that's what I'm still doing today. Um, but that also led to information about early European firearms. And again, there were very controversial um, or contradictory assessments about their effectiveness. <clears throat> For example, when I was reading the works of historians who published, let's say, in the um, periods, uh, the, the early 20th century, uh, up until the end of the Second World War, there were often um, very one-sided assessments. Uh, historians like that, who were mostly not indigenous historians, would make the claim that incoming European technology was far superior to anything that indigenous people had at the time, and that indigenous people did their utmost to obtain this technology from European traders and eventually discarded their own traditional technology. Of course, you can imagine me being an archery person that didn't sit quite well. Uh, and I began to question that. Um, was this really as one-sided as it was described? And was access to European firearms the only reason why one indigenous group was able to displace another that did not have access to these weapons? And sure enough, of course, I came across other literature shortly thereafter. Uh, there was another generation of scholars starting in the 1970s, um, 60s, 70s, um, criticizing or critiquing those views. And one of the most prominent proponents of that was the uh, American anthropologist John Townsend, who published an article in 1983 about the impact or lack thereof that firearms had had in relations between Russian fur traders and different indigenous peoples in Alaska, mostly the Aleut, the, um, uh, the Konyak, and the Tlingit. So according to Joan Townsend and other historians and anthropologists of, of her generation, European firearms, were quite ineffective at the time. And we're talking about uh, firearms before 1850, weapons that were generally muzzle-loading uh, weapons that used loose powder and ball, mostly uh, with flintlock ignition, or later also percussion locks. Um, and while earlier historians had made the claim that it was those weapons that had a principal impact on the relations between different indigenous groups, Townsend and uh, researchers in her generation claimed the opposite, saying that these weapons were really not very effective and that they had uh, maybe a prestige or a ceremonial value at best. 
so they would point out, for example, the long time it took to load a muzzle-loading firearm. And then, of course, most of these weapons were smoothbore um, guns, so they didn't have rifling in the barrel, but just uh, uh, a smooth inside of the barrel, so uh, accuracy would be less. And often they misfired if they worked at all or exploded in the face of the user in some occasions. Um, and that is all true. But what got me to question that view then uh, were the historical sources of the time. Uh, not only non-Indigenous observers like British and French fur traders and explorers, but also Indigenous peoples themselves writing or giving their opinion, their experiences at the time. Because there is a pattern that is fairly consistent uh, throughout North America, uh, going from east to west for the most part, where as soon as one indigenous group obtains firearms uh, from some European colonial power, be it the Dutch, the French, or the British, then tries their very best to keep those weapons away from their enemies. And um, in agreement with that, uh, European fur traders on site at the time also stated that it was access to firearms that was the principal reason why one indigenous group was able to displace another or you know access uh, lack of access to firearms for those who were being displaced now how does this come together how does this make sense if these weapons were so problematic and accident prone as townsend described um so to answer that question, I looked mostly at the region of the Northern Plains. And I'm going to show you um, a few slides. So I'm going to share the screen. Here we are. There. So here you have my name and uh, affiliation, and that's the title of the presentation. So I look mostly at the Northern Plains and the Subarctic, and here is a map of, um, or including the Northern Plains, you can see the contemporary political boundaries. Here is the border between the United States and Canada, the 49th parallel. Uh, north of that, you have the provinces of Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and a little bit of British Columbia here. And then on the other side, we have the states of Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, and so forth. Superimposed are the locations of indigenous peoples um, in and around the year 1800, more or less. And that is the, the region, and these are the ethnic groups that I looked at in my research. This is research that came out of uh, the dissertation I wrote quite a while back now, I have to say. Um, but since then, new information has come to light, which is why I'm presenting to you now. So, um, one of the things I do, um, Besides make bows and arrows, I also give my students an opportunity to try them out. So we usually go to archery ranges in and around the city here, and students can have an opportunity to try reproductions of indigenous weapons and see what it feels like to draw a plain style bow and shoot arrows um, at hay bales and things like that. In the context of these um, activities, students asked me quite often whether it would be possible for them to learn how to make their own archery equipment. So out of that came uh, a field course about experiential learning that we set up 
with a family uh, I'm working with, friends of ours who own and operate a bison ranch in southwestern Manitoba, south of Riding Mountain National Park. Uh, this family is uh, of mixed ancestry, mixed heritage. Um, they are uh, Anishinaabe or Soto on the indigenous side and Swiss on the, the non-indigenous side. Um, and one day I was visiting there and had a discussion with uh, rancher Tom Schlupp, who um, runs the place, together with his wife and his son and daughter. And uh, I was making the same claims that historians had made, uh, or anthropologists had made in the pre-World War II era, stating that against uh, firearms like the North Northwest trade gun, indigenous rawhide armor and rawhide shields would probably have been useless. But Tom was skeptical. He uh, didn't want to believe that at face value and asked me if I'd ever seen a rawhide shield made from bison hide up close. And I had to admit that at that point I had not. So he showed me one and we uh, set it up was actually an incomplete shield that he never got to finish, but we set it up in the yard and started shooting at it um, with arrows as well as with a 50 caliber muzzle loading rifle. And the results of that I will show you at the closer to the end of the presentation. But let me get back to the shields for a minute here. What you see here on the screen has often been referred to as the shield-bearing shield bearing warrior motif. Uh, these are rock carvings, rock engravings that can be found uh, in different sites all the way from southwestern Alberta, for example, writing on Stone Provincial Park, which is just north of the border to Montana, uh, south of Calgary, uh, all the way into uh, southwest and South Dakota, and the, uh, the figures resemble uh, each other quite a bit. There's always this big circular line with um, lines at the bottom and a dot at the top, uh, being the, the stylized representation of a person carrying a shield and maybe in this case also a lance. Um, this would be showing two people in combat um, there are other similar uh, um, engravings like that. And as I said, they can be found in different places all the way from southern Alberta into um, throughout Montana and North and South Dakota. Uh, some of these are very old, others may be younger. It's not always easy to date rock art. Um, but if you go to the next image, we do have um, images created by European visitors to the Northern Plains. For example, these two are based on paintings by the Swiss painter Karl Bodmer, who visited uh, Northern and Western Montana in and around the 1830s, 1833 to 34. And he observed um, indigenous people, for example, uh, among the Nakoda or Cinnaboyne or the Mandan, uh, carrying shields like that, big rawhide shields, as you can see here. Um, for those of you who already know their, their Bodmer imagery, you'll notice that the proportions aren't quite right. The shield is a bit too small. Um, but that's because uh, for copyright reasons, I had an illustrator redraw those images. So these are not the originals. But I think you get the, the general idea. And finally, um, here on the right hand side is a photograph of an Apache warrior with a, uh, a large rawhide shield. This was taken in the late 19th century, it's based on a photograph. And the other drawing here is um, based on a photograph 
that was made in 1925. It shows members of the Pactol family uh, who found original surviving rawhide shields in a cave in Utah in 1925 on their, their property, their ranch. Um, these shields have since been repatriated. I believe they went to the Navajo Nation. But you can see how large these things are. Um, and that is quite consistent, if I may scroll back here, to the shield-bearing warrior motif engraved in so many rock art sites uh, throughout the Western Plains. So I was wondering how a shield like that would hold up against musket balls. Now here is a drawing of the most common type of firearm available to indigenous people through the fur trade from around the, um, the late 18th century, the 1770s, uh, into the late 19th century. This is, for example, what the Hudson's Bay Company and its Montreal-based competition sold to indigenous people. Um, when we go back to the article by Joan Townsend about um, indigenous and, and Russian relations in Alaska, um, I need to make it clear that she often referred to, for her comparative examples, to firearms used by the British military at the time. And indeed, fur trading companies tried to sell decommissioned military weapons to indigenous people. Uh, for example, on the coast of Hudson Bay, the Hudson's Bay Company tried that at, as early as the early 1700s. But indigenous people often rejected those weapons, stating that the idea was good in principle, but that the military muskets were too large, too heavy, too cumbersome. They wanted a weapon that was shorter, lighter, um, yet still effective on big game. I mean, on the coast of Hudson Bay, people have to deal with polar bears. Uh, or would go moose hunting, so you need a weapon that's effective on animals like that. Uh, and also had some features that indigenous people requested, for example, the larger trigger guard, so the weapon could be fired wearing mittens or gloves, um, a straighter stock, and various other um, improvements. So you could argue that the, the Northwest trade gun was at least in part a firearm designed by indigenous people. Uh, now, why would they go through all that trouble if these weapons were so inferior and so ineffective? So this is the standard type of smoothbore muzzle-loading muskets sold throughout the fur trade. Uh, it was called Northwest Trade Gun, not because it was only sold by the Northwest Company, but it was to be sold in what was then considered to be the northwest of the continent. And that, of course, shifted with uh, the, the westward advance of the fur trade. So the northwest, let's say, in the early 1700s would have been the western end of the Great Lakes. By the late 1700s, the northwest was the Yukon um, and parts of the um, uh, the Northwest Territories and Southern Alaska. So this is how muzzle-loading firearms with a flintlock ignition system work. Um, if I go back here, you'll see the hammer of the weapon holds a piece of flint. When the user pulls the trigger, the hammer um, slams forward and uh, the flint will strike this piece of metal here called the frizzen. A spark is created, and as the flint hits that piece of metal, it snaps forward, letting the, the spark fall into the pan of the weapon where the priming powder has been put. Once that ignites, it sets off the main charge inside the barrel through a touch hole. So there's a, a hole here that goes inside the end of the barrel. Uh, 
and that's what releases the uh, the charge that's what propels the bullet out of the barrel now on the other side of this mechanism uh, is uh, a side plate to hold the whole thing in place and they were often cast in the shape of a sea serpent or a dragon made from brass I don't really know why European manufacturers choose this design, possibly because they already had molds like that and was fairly easy and inexpensive to produce. But indigenous people on the coast of Hudson Bay and later on the plains, of course, were quite stunned to see this because uh, this resembles a mythical creature. Uh, for example, in Algonquian tradition, the Mishipishu, the, the, the great water lynx or the water uh, underwater panther, the water monster, the sea serpent, which also has coppery scales, sometimes horns, so that for indigenous people, um, that also added uh, a spiritual component to these weapons. Now, um, looking at the accounts of fur traders and explorers, one that stands out is um, an account by David Thompson. David Thompson used to work for the Hudson's Bay Company and later for the Northwest Company. When he was 17 years old, he was sent on a mission to strengthen the trading ties between the Hudson's Bay Company and the Pocani. The Pocani are one of the three nations of the, um, <clears throat> the Nitsitapi or the Blackfoot Alliance, now live on the Blackfeet Reservation in Montana, the Northern Pecani on the Pagan Reserve in Alberta. And when Thompson <clears throat> stayed with the Pecani in 1787, he was put under the protection of an old man who lived in the community. His name was Sakumapi. Um, Maybe that's somewhat ironic because Sakomapi in Blackfoot means boy. Um, I don't know why an elder who was in his 80s would have that name, but there it is. And Sakomapi, who hosted the young David Thompson, was actually Cree by birth, and he had married into the Bokani community and um, risen there to the position of war chief, partly because of his military skill. And that also came from the firearms he brought to the community. Uh, Sakomapi described several battles that he had taken part in. Um, one of them stands out because it featured two rows of warriors opposing each other, um, taking cover behind large rawhide shields, and then trying to shoot at each other with bows and arrows at a distance of about 60 yards. And uh, uh, as a young man, Sakamapi and some of his followers from his community who had joined this battle brought uh, several Northwest trade guns um, into the fray. And that's what swayed the battle in favor of the Blackfoot and their Cree and the Cinnaboyne allies. Uh, and what he would describe is that um, the shield bearers and the archers would come cover the musketeers while they were reloading their weapons. And something similar is depicted here in uh, an image from somewhat later times from the late 19th century. This came from an Arikara artist from North Dakota. It's not quite clear uh, who the indigenous people are fighting each other. One side are the Arikara, but it's not clear who their opponents might have been at this point but you can clearly see the combined use of flintlock firearms and bows and arrows and big shields or smaller shields here too. So that brings us to the experiment that we did. Here is the rawhide shield that we actually shot at. And this project that my friend Tom Schlup started at the ranch never got finished because the shield um, did not shrink evenly. Uh, 
So what he did was he took the throat skin of a bison bull and shrank it the way it was traditionally done over heat. So he dug a pit in the ground, heated rocks and a fire nearby, placed the rocks in the pit, and then stretched the green hide over top of the pit, leaving a little opening and poured water in it. And the rising steam then condensed and shrank the hide. And then uh, as the hide shrinks, the, the pegs around it are adjusted inward, and the process is repeated several times. And if it all works well, the height will shrink to an even thickness. But this one didn't, and it also became quite wavy. It didn't have a, a mild curve, but it, it actually is quite, quite um, uneven that way. And so he never finished it, but that day we had that discussion about the efficiency of, or the penetrative force of musket balls. We set this up at about 25 yards, and this is the uh, the distance we were shooting at. So this is this photo was taken from the side of the target, so you get an idea of uh, how far away this was. Twenty five yards, knelt and shot this distance at the shield. That is uh, Tom San Cheyenne shooting the muzzle loading rifle we used. So each each of us took a turn. Um, I think Tom Tom shot twice and Cheyenne and I once each. Uh, this was my first time firing a muzzle loader. And I was, I'm not bragging, I was able to hit the thing at the first try, uh, which just goes to show that rifling increases accuracy and that it's maybe not as hard as being accurate with a bow at the same distance. Of course, 25 meters is not, or yards is not that far away. Uh, but I was, was able to hit it. Uh, and so, you know, other uninitiated people probably could too. Um, so what happened when the bullets struck the shield? Oops, sorry. Here we go. Um, actually, I might just show you. I'm going to stop the share here. And I'm going to pull out, first of all, the kind of musket ball that we use. This is the... 50 caliber type ball. Um, and here's a piece of buffalo hide. As you can see, this is soft and flexible and quite thin. This would be, for example, uh, a hide used for making clothing or containers. But the same material can be shrunk to an incredible thickness of a full inch almost. So this is the original shield. As you can see, this side is almost a full inch thick. And then it dwindles down to about a quarter inch thickness on this side. And as you can see, on the thin side, the musket balls had no problem penetrating this. But on the thick side, this is the outside here, you see there's a bullet going in and it didn't quite come out. It's still stuck in there. I don't know if you can see it. It's lodged in the hide. So a simple piece of animal hide, dried and or shrunk and dried to the proper thickness, can actually stop a musket ball. I was quite surprised to see that. And when I then learned that the uh, Pactol shields in, uh, that were found in Utah, which were dated roughly to the 17th century, so the, the mid 1600s, that they are actually three feet across and an inch and a half in thickness throughout, I was quite surprised because first of all, this little shield here is already about four pounds in weight. So you can imagine if you have a shield large enough to cover somebody from chin to halfway down the calf, um, that would weigh much more, maybe around 24, 25 pounds. 
similar in weight, let's say, to uh, the shield used by the Roman legionaries in, in ancient Rome. Um, so, musket balls can be stopped by rawhide shields, but eventually, these shields throughout uh, the 1600s, 1700s, and then the 19th century did get smaller and smaller. Uh, and the accompanying rawhide armor that indigenous people on the plains would wear was also being discarded by and large, partly because um, when musket balls strike someone's body, they will pull bits of clothing or whatever is on the skin into the wound, causing greater potential for infection, so that indigenous people discarded their body armor um, and uh, would thus get, if they got hit, a cleaner wound. Shields were also becoming smaller because increasingly people placed more importance on the spiritual protective power of the shield rather than the physical. Um, so taken together, all of this, um, I think, lines up quite nicely with the assessments of fur traders and explorers at the time, and indigenous people's um, comments on these weapons recorded in the 1700s and early 1800s, um, stating that these weapons were quite effective, actually. So to conclude this, it's not just the equipment um, that makes for effectiveness, it's also the skill of the user. Keep in mind that, let's say, um, European settlers usually came from societies that very much restricted access to weaponry, especially firearms. Uh, European soldiers were also often conscripts, um, not always well trained. In contrast, uh, indigenous men, at least, were expected to be providers and protectors, so they were geared towards um, thinking like a hunter and warrior and, and developing the hand-eye coordination from an early age. Uh, so switching between a bow and arrow and a muzzle-loading musket might not have been that difficult for them. I've seen this done uh, for myself in contemporary times. I've had people who never handled a bow and arrow before do quite well, and these people are also good shots with rifles. Um, and of course, there are also examples from the 19th century about this. Uh, for example, a shooting competition between fur trader Isaac Cowie uh, of the Hudson's Bay Company and uh, an indigenous boy from uh, the Soto Nation, the Anishinaabe, while traveling from Winnipeg to Fort Ellis. Um, Cowie was traveling with the boy's family and that family was using an old Hudson's Bay flintlock trade gun musket for all their hunting. They were hunting uh, moose with that as well as waterfowl because these guns could also be used as shotguns instead of a solid lead ball. People would use pellets. Uh, and so Isaac Cowie and the about eight year old boy um, were, were having shooting competitions and yeah, the kid always won. Uh, they even switched their guns uh, to see whether it was just the, the equipment. And even with um, Isaac Cowie's rifle, the boy still won, even though it was unfamiliar to him. Uh, and Cowie still didn't hit anything with the big trade gun. So I'm thinking it's also the skill and the mindset of the user that contributes to the effectiveness of these weapons. And finally, um, Evidence that I found uh, from eyewitnesses, from participants at the time who observed how indigenous people were using their, their firearms in battle uh, makes it clear that these weapons were used at very close range, often uh, 25 meters or less from ambush positions as an initial kind of shock artillery, and then uh, the battle was, was finished with traditional weapons. 
Um, so there was no need for long range accuracy for these uh, guns to be effective. Um, and also the reloading speed could be enhanced with a number of fairly unsafe shortcuts, I have to say. Um, the, uh, the standard rate of fire of British infantry of the line was about three shots per minute. And these were really well-trained soldiers. But if some of the steps of reloading a muzzle-loading weapon were omitted, uh, that could be doubled. Uh, and I've seen this um, documented in accounts by indigenous people or about uh, trappers on, on the, uh, in the upper Missouri region reloading their weapons that way. And it's also been shown to me by the curator of firearms at the, uh, the Glenbow Museum in Calgary that you actually can shorten the reloading time uh, and bring it to about double of what the British infantry was capable of. Of course, after that, it would get very dangerous because all the, the powder residue in the barrel would probably cause some kind of uh, accident eventually. But for a short time, maybe six to ten shots, you could probably get off in uh, around two, two, three minutes. Of course, that's still slower than bows and arrows, but with an arrow, you have to be surgical in what you're hitting whereas the shocking power of a musket ball uh, is about 10 times that of an arrow, uh, and that makes it less crucial of where exactly, uh, and I'm talking about combat here, where exactly somebody gets hit. All of this taken together, I think, points to um, firearms uh, having had an importance in um, indigenous military relations, but they're not the only uh, reason in of themselves. It's not just the technology, but it's also how indigenous people adapted it and how they used it, which was often quite different from what Europeans had designed these weapons for. And also indigenous people's use of these European weapons together with their old uh, uh, proven indigenous technology like archery and other distance weapons which were not immediately discarded, but were often used side by side for, for many generations. So that, that's all I have to say, and I would open it up for questions. Thank you for listening. I missed most of your presentation, but um, there's a connection between, is there a connection between firearms and the enrichment of the uh, Stikine people? Because as I understand, you know, went from the uh, uh, sea otter trade, you know, faded away and the trade on the Stikine River became really important to the fur, fur trade. And did, were firearms uh, part of that, the hunting and so on? Um, that's a bit out of my area. Big Arbor, the Hudson's Bay Company and its company arms wherever they went. Um, in the Plains region, they seem to have been used mostly for combat, less so for hunting. But in the subarctic and the boreal forest, and probably on the west coast, um, there was more of a, of a use in, in hunting for um, muzzle-loading guns, for example, moose hunting in the subarctic. Uh, hunting fur-bearing animals with a muzzle-loading musket that is something that, for example, um, some of the, the Pakani people did on the Northern Plains when they finally um, began to bring beaver pelts to the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, they had been very reluctant to, to hunt beaver um, for a number of reasons, partly because they were 
an important aspect of their cosmology. They were spiritually important, but they also create water tables, which of course you need for your horses. Uh, and so instead of trapping beaver, like most other indigenous people in the north were doing, they would shoot them with muskets. And you can imagine the holes that those pelts had after that. So the Hudson's Bay Company was probably not too keen on, you know, getting mangled beaver for trade. But um, I would think for a large game, definitely, especially for, for bear hunting, for example, I think... Uh, muskets were quite important and i don't know uh, this might also be uh, a direction for further research you know um people at the time were generally physically quite fit and strong uh, men but also women if you've ever worked on tanning a hide or something like that you can figure that out quite quickly um, but when you're operating a bow and arrow, you're using muscle groups that you might not uh, in other activities. So when guns came in, the specialized muscle memory that you need for archery wasn't really required. And I wonder if in some communities, um, women began to hunt also or to take part in the defense of the community with guns once they were available but i don't know this this is just something i'm throwing out there to you know for further research yeah questions well thank you for your presentation thank you for listening and for having me um i hope the rest of the conference goes well Thank you. That was very good. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll be signing off then. Have a good weekend, everyone.